Praise the Lord. Victorious church, I said, praise the Lord. We well, thank the Lord for what the Lord has been doing in your life. And I pray that all these blessings from all the ministers and from the choristers, I pray the blessings will be permanent in your life in Jesus' name. No more falling and rising. No more going forward and going backwards. The victory of the resurrection power of Christ will abide permanently in every life in Jesus' name. We have heard so much, we have learned so much. It's like we should um, maybe just close up. But the blessings of God are inexhaustible. Much is coming upon your life again. I will receive more. I will get more. Your cup will overflow in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your people alive, awake, and active, and willing to receive, even though we've gone so far and so deep. Lord, I'm praying your people will not endure in vain in Jesus' name. Great blessings, greater blessings, great manifestation, greater manifestation. You'll give to everyone in Jesus' name. Bless all our leaders. Bless all our workers. Bless all our singers. Bless all our ushers. Bless all our security. And all the people that are doing their best to make this matches reach out to us as you are blessing us. Bless them in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, even what they are not asking for, but you know it's good for them, give unto them in Jesus' name. The more blessed they are, the more blessed we are. We're asking, oh Lord, that at this time, you bless everyone in Jesus' name. We well, thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God has blessed you already. You can see that in the blessings of God. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I read from verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. The Lord is praying for you. The apostles are praying for you. Our leaders are praying for you. And to desire that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That she might walk worthy of the Lord. That she might walk worthy of the Lord. Unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of of God. It talks about our worthiness there. Because Christ died for us, because Christ was buried, and because Christ rose again, and because Christ has ascended unto heaven, because of that resurrection power, now we can be made worthy. And it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing you will please the Lord. When we talk about worthiness, you understand, it's not the whole of the world that is worthy to be in the presence of God. Sin separates us from God. The falling race is separated from the Almighty God. But as we repent, as we return to the Lord, and as the blood of Jesus cleanses us, and all our sins are forgiven and forgotten, now we are worthy to come to the presence of God. We are worthy to enter into the very kingdom. 
We're worthy to have our names in the book of life. We're worthy to enjoy all the inheritance of the saints on high. We're worthy to work for the Lord. And we're worthy to have inheritance given to us here on earth and in the glory above. And when we leave this world, we'll be worthy to be in heaven. God will make you worthy. I say God will make you worthy. Worthy to be in heaven forever. Look at Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Thou hast a few names, even in studies, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. Made worthy by the cleansing of that blood. Made worthy by the forgiveness, by the freedom he has given us. Made worthy because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's worthiness when in the future you get to heaven because you are going there. Because you are getting there. And the Almighty God will look at you with smile and delight. And Jesus Christ will introduce you to the angels and to the Father and say, That's my son, that's my daughter. He was washed, she was washed, bought by the blood of the Lamb. You'll be worthy for that in Jesus' name. Actually, the intention of God is that all humanity shall be worthy. Adam was worthy. Eve was worthy. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And let us uh, give them dominion and their dominion over everything on earth. And he put them in the garden of Eden. And every evening the cool of the day will come to them. They were worthy of his fellowship. They were worthy of his presence. They were worthy of everything he had created. Everything was under their dominion until something happened. That Adam and Eve fell into sin. They fell from grace to grass. They fell from up the highest point and they fell to the lowest point. Adam, where art thou? Where are you? He was not worthy now to confidently stand in the presence of the Lord. I had your voice in the garden and I'm hiding myself. Something had happened. That's the corruption that came into this world that damaged us unworthy. But then the Lord Jesus Christ came. He said, he will bring us back. He said, he will bring you back. That place of worthiness, he wants to bring us back there. And many of us who are here, we are back already. I'm back into the grace of God. I'm back to the presence of God. And now because he has cleansed us, because he has washed us, he makes us worthy. And then as we continue with the Lord, I will continue. I said as we continue with the Lord, I will continue. On that final day when the Lord will count his own and the saints go marching in, you'll be worthy to be there. I will be worthy to be there. And forever and forever and forever, we will be in the presence of the Lord, worthy because of the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Our worthiness through his resurrection power. Our worthiness, your worthiness, my worthiness, our worthiness through his resurrection power. We're going to look at the whole story. Number one, the corruption that marked our worthiness, that stained our worthiness, that spoiled our worthiness. The corruption 
that match our worthiness. Point number two, the connection that makes us worthy. The connection that makes us worthy. You are connected back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that connection, once again, we're made worthy. Number three is the circumcision that maintains our worldliness. What happened to the first Adam, what happened to Eve, must not be allowed to happen again. As we make us worthy, we must not slide back. We must not go back. There must be something God will do that he will maintain our worthiness. The circumcision that maintains our worthiness. Look at point number one. The corruption that match our worthiness. We're coming to Genesis chapter one, looking at the beginning. Genesis chapter one, we're looking at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, at our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. Worthiness, over all the earth. The love of God was splashed on man and the woman. Adam and Eve, and over all creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. Adam and Eve were the crown of his creation. Adam and Eve were the beloved in his sight, and he put everything under them. That's worthiness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, you are worthy. Bring forth offspring that will also be worthy. You are created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Bring forth offspring, children, sons and daughters that will carry that image as well. I go on to say, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it. I've given you the key. I've given you the power. I give you the authority. You are worthy in my sight. So have dominion over the fish of the sea. Over the fowl of the air. Over every living thing that moves upon the earth. But eventually you know what happened. It's a story of the fall of man. As a result of that, corruption came into the world. Corruption in the life of everyone that God now says is going to reverse everything he had put in place. Look at Genesis chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The fall had taken place, and it degenerates, defiled, and rotting nature has come into man. Not only Adam, not only Eve, all their offspring, everyone that now God said, as he looked at everyone, he said the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of every man was evil, only evil, and that continually, verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had created man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Man became unworthy, unworthy of his pleasure, unworthy of his goodness, unworthy of all his delight. They were now he grieved to the heart of the Lord. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing 
and the fowls of the air, for it reprinted me. I regret. I'm changing my mind. The worthiness I give them, the dominion I give them, and withdrawing that because of corruption that came in. For it repented me that I have made them. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. And God is incorruptible. And God is pure. And God is perfect. So the corrupt cannot be worthy in the sight of the perfect. The sinful cannot be worthy in the sight of the holy. And the unclean cannot be perfect, cannot be worthy in the sight of the one that is immaculately clean. And God looked upon the earth in verse 12, and behold, it was corrupt. Every man, every woman, all the people on earth, everything was corrupt. And it says, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. That's what brought the judgment of the flood. And the whole of humanity was swept away from the presence of the Lord. They were swept away into eternal separation from the Almighty God. And God started again. You know, Noah was preserved and his family. And later he called Abraham. And he went on and on and on. And the children of Israel became a nation. And the Lord said, I'll start with them. And he told Pharaoh, let my people go. He delighted in them. He's found people again. And he has found the people that will follow him. And they'll be worthy in his sight. Ah, look at Exodus chapter 32. That bad story was repeated again. Corruption took over. Worthiness was cancelled. A man became unworthy as a whole. Already the whole of Egypt, they were unworthy. Amalekites were unworthy. The Moabites were unworthy. All the nations of the earth, they corrupted themselves and the hope was on Israel. But now Exodus chapter 32 verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go. Get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Have corrupted themselves. Again, that worthiness was taken away from them because they became unworthy. In fact, here is a final verdict in verse 33. Verse 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. They were not worthy to be in the presence of God, to be in the book of God. They were all wiped away. Maybe something now will happen that the people will learn their lesson and all that corruption will come to an end. We're looking at Psalm 53, reading from verse 1. Psalm 53, I'm reading from verse 1. The story of humanity by going up and down. And it came so low that God said, there's no one that is worthy. Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They even live their lives now without the thought of God, without the presence of God, without the pardon of God, without the power of God, without anything to do with the Lord. Look at verse 1. Corrupt are they. Corrupt are they. The world corrupted itself. The high and the low. The educated, the uneducated. The one in the farm, the one in the city, corrupt are they. They have done abominable iniquity. And there is none that doeth good. None that doeth good. That's the corruption that match our worthiness. Sin cuts us away from the Lord. And instead of being worthy, we are unworthy. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men. 
to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back, and they are all together become filthy, defiled, dirty, stinking. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then God began to send prophets to them. And these prophets tried to turn them from their evil way so that they will have worthiness again. What was the response to the prophets? And what was the effect of the prophets on them? Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. The history of generations of people that went into corruption and because of that corruption in individual lives, the corruption in families, and the corruption in every nation. Then everywhere was polluted and there was no worthiness at all. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors not only that they are corrupt they corrupt other people they corrupt innocent minds they corrupt those who are growing up they corrupt those who are just coming to the world and they pass their corruption on to other people it says they are corruptors they are forsaking the lord and they are provoked the holy one of israel unto anger they are gone away backward and instead of seeking the face of the Lord aright they substituted rituals and ceremonies for righteousness look at verse 11 to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me says the Lord I am full of burnt offerings of rams and a fat of fed bees I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lambs of the goats. When ye come to appear before me, was required this at your hand to tread my cause. They were unworthy. Unworthy to even approach the presence of the Lord. Bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the servers, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even your solemn meetings, your new moons and your appointed fees, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. They were corrupt, and they were corrupt. They were corrupt through and through. In their heart, they were corrupt. In the works of their hand, they were corrupt. In their worship, they were corrupt. In their sacrifices, they were corrupt. And God said, take it away from me. You are unworthy to approach even my presence. I told you that is saying to pastors and preachers and prophets to them. And those prophets try to bring them back to the state of worthiness. Those preachers themselves... Those prophets themselves, those priests themselves, see what happened to them, Malachi. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 5. Malachi, chapter 2. We're looking at verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. I was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. Before we go on, you think about our local church here, little church here, Deeper Life Bible Church. As we started Deeper Christian Life Ministry, 
and people were coming to the Bible study. They were hearing the word of God. And we taught the word of God in our hearts. You find people, Monday Bible study, they are running, literally running to the Bible study. They don't want to miss anything of the Bible study. And when the word of God reached out to them, they will pray and pray and pray. Some will cry, some will scream, and some will be on their face before the Lord. Some will kneel, some will stand, and we will not even close in prayer. They ju will just leave them praying and praying and praying. And when heaven has descended upon their soul, and the word of God is inside their heart, and they have promised the Lord, I'm going to correct that wrong thing, I'm going to make that restitution, and I'm going to set that thing right, and with courage and conviction, they rose up from prayer, and they went back to their offices everywhere, righteousness spreading, and the good gospel of the Lord spreading in the lives of people. And then we started the retreat, and then at the retreat, people welcome. And when they come to that retreat, they drop their load. They're not even wondering, where will I sleep? Where will they not sleep? And they fall on their faces before the Lord, and they said, Lord, do it for me again. Renew my life again. Revitalize my life again. And then we finish every message. You hear people praying over there and praying over there. And they will pray and pray until heaven will descend upon their soul. There was no argument. There was no disagreement. Everything just went on smoothly. And it was like these people were reading about now. But now... Look at the story. Let me go on in verse in verse 8. It says in verse 8, but he had departed out of the way. It's happening again. The people that God had even said to them, and he has said, You are the hope of the nation. And that nation is the hope of the rest of the world. And the word of God will go through to other people from them. They were departed out of the way. They have caused many to stumble at the law. The ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Corruption came back again. And as you think about our church, the church that was reputed for being holy, for being righteous, for being transparent. You know, in those days, uh, people, if they've done anything they shouldn't have done, and we mistakenly give them a message to preach at the retreat on their own without anybody reporting them, they will come and say, I'm not qualified, I'm not fit, I need to settle some things in my life. Did he hide anything? And if you ask them, what you see to are settling your life? They'll say, I'm settling this. I'm settling this. Give me time. I don't want to preach now. If they don't come, their wives might come. And their wives will say, my husband is not ready to keep on preaching now because there is something we're looking at in the family and it's not qualified. Or their friends will come and their friends will say so and so. It's not worthy now. It was trans spirit until things began to change that some people will be asking who told the pastor how did the pastor know that and then people now are afraid to even come out clean on their own when they do anything evil and they have corrupted themselves and you don't know and they're still preaching on, on, on Sunday they're still preaching on Thursday no wonder nothing is happening because there is hidden corruption at the end the various sections the leader in the section there is to protect his people in sin is to cover them up in sin corruption at setting and our worthiness has been taken away look at verse 9 Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. I've been partial in the law. Corruption brings partiality. You deal with this one firmly. And then there's another person that has done a similar thing. And then you're thinking now, if we apply the stick, 
if we apply the rod, if we apply the word of God to this one, even though we know he's guilty, we know he's not qualified, and we know he's corrupt, what are we going to do? Because there are people that will, you know, stand up and say, no, if he is not there, church will collapse. If he is not there, we will scatter the church. If he is not there, nothing will move. The corruption is taking a higher level. But God is going to bring us back. I said God will bring us back. Uh, look at New Testament now. I'm reading from Romans chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 3. We're looking at verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. They carried on religion. They carried on in tradition. And it says, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used the seed. The poison of ass or snake or serpent is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are sweet to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That was made the people unworthy. I told you and I read it to you in the Old Testament. The preachers, the pastors, the prophets, the priests who are supposed to bring them back into the state of worthiness. They also went astray. It happened like that in the New Testament in Second Peter. I'm reading to you from chapter 2. Second Peter. I'm reading from chapter 2. In Second Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 19, 2 Peter, chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 19. It says in verse 19, While they promised them liberty, preachers, pastors, prophets, evangelists, bishops, archbishops, and um, apostles, they promised them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. They're promising you find a church there, and that church is saying, Come, this will happen, that will happen. If you discipline anyone in a Bible believing church, instead of his staying and instead of his praying, and instead of his praying until he gets through and he comes back in the sight of God, restored and cleansed and pure. He says, don't worry, you discipline me here. He goes to that other church, goes to that other ministry, and goes to that other assembly. And he says, oh, don't worry, we know deeper life. That's how they are. Come on here. And they give him position there. The position that will drive him and sink him to hell fire. Because you know, they promise them liberty. And those who are promising them liberty, they are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again. And they saw the swine, the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. You will not die in corruption. You will not die in pollution. And better face 
the real sin and go on your knees and go on your face before the Lord and say, Lord, do it again. Cleanse me again. Revive me again. Let the power of your resurrection do it. You walk in me. If you are walking in the church and you are holding on to that position, but you know that inside you, corruption has conquered you. Corruption has pervaded all your life. Your wife knows it, or your husband knows it, or your children know it, or there are some few people that know it, but they say, they will not hear from my mouth, they will not hear from my mouth, and you're still walking. You know that if you die in that condition, you'll go to hell. Don't let corruption take the better part of you. Repent and turn and seek the face of the Lord and God will bring you back. Somebody there said God will bring you back. And then you'll make your connection again. Point number two now. The connection that makes us worthy. The connection that makes us worthy. I'm coming to Colossians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. It says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. How did that happen? That he came to the stage, they came to the standing, and they came to the situation they could be worthy. Look at verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, even the forgiveness of sin, even the forgiveness of sin. When you confess your sin, he that covereth up, Hiding a sin will not prosper. It will not have fellowship with God. It will not have worthiness in the sight of God. Whatever you are using to cover that sin, you will not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that mercy will connect you back again to the worthiness we have in the Lord. We're looking at Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 51. We're looking at verse 6. In Psalm 51 verse 6, it says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, not superficial on your leaves, not superficial on your tongue. God desires truth in the inward part. And it says, in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Esau. This was a king, King David. He had done something. And the people in his household, they knew about it. They were even supporters. He sent them to go and call the woman. And they knew something had happened. He wrote a letter and said, Joab, when this letter gets to you, this is what you will do. Get rid of the man, and the man was killed. And that's the reason why David could not deal with Joab. There was too much of the secret of David in the hands of Joab. Because Joab was the one that did his dirty job for him. But now David came out clear. He came out to the open. And he came out and he said, I have seen. You must come out like that in the presence of God. If there is a job that is trying to hide it for you, a job that is trying to cover it up for you, if you are going to become worthy again in the sight of the Lord, to stand in the presence of God, to live in the presence of God, to abide in the presence of God, to walk in the presence of God, acceptably you must come out clean and as you come out clean and you say purge me with Esau 
and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. Cast me not away from your presence. I understand I'm not worthy now to be in your presence. I understand I've blown it. I understand I have fallen. I understand I have done the unthinkable and I'm not worthy to be in your presence. But Lord, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13, then after that restoration, then after that cleansing, then after that purging, then after making your way right with God, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. If we're going to have that worthiness back, you'll have it back. I said we will have it back. Look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 6. In Luke chapter 19, verse 6. And he made haste. And he came down and received him joyfully. That's talking about Zacchaeus. He was a sinner. And people knew he was a publican. And people knew that there were a lot of dirty things in his life. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Maybe some, there's somebody there that the person you are living a kind of dirty life with, he didn't know that you are even a member of this church and he was invited to the retreat. And he came with an open mind. I want to go. They've been inviting me for a long time. I'm going to get there. And lo and behold, he got here. And then he saw you. You were serving. You were doing something. Say, what? Of all people, look at this one. I know his life through and through. He is corrupt. He is dirty. He is a liar. He defiles women. Or if it's a woman, she is a, everybody knows her to be a public person. That everybody can get at her and get to her anytime. So he is also a worker. So she is also a worker there. That's why they grumbled that he was gone to be cast for to a man that's a sinner. But the chaos did not waste time. You will not waste time. I said you will not waste time. As Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. There's always an evidence of conversion, always an evidence of salvation, always an evidence of restoration. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything, if I have taken anything, have you taken somebody's certificate and you're working with that certificate? If I have taken anything, have you taken somebody's wife away from him and that divorcee is now your wife? If I have taken anything, have you taken, you know, precious and belonging to other people and you're using it and you're saying, I'm born again, I'm born again. No, you are not. No, you are not. There must be the evidence of repentance, evidence of regeneration in your life. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. And that's how we get connected back again and we're going to remain connected. I am going to remain connected. Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21, we're reading from verse 34. Here we're told in verse 34.
4 of Luke chapter 21. It says in verse 34, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sufficient. There's some things that happen in the world. If you allow them in your heart, it will blindfold you. It will make you almost like drunk. It will be staggering. You will not have the correct evaluation of things anymore. You will overreach the things of this world. You'll underrate the things of heaven. When your heart is overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and the cares of this life. So that they come upon you unawares for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore. Are you born again? Watch ye therefore. Are you sanctified? Watch ye therefore. Have you been qualified? Have you been made worthy by the blood of the Lamb? Watch ye, therefore, have you come out of the world and all the degradation in the world? Watch ye, therefore, in verse 36, and pray always that she may be accounted worthy. That she may be accounted worthy. It's not just I'm coming to church and worthy. No, not at all. You will watch. You will pray. You will separate yourself from the things that are trying to pull you down and from the cares of this life. What she there for? And pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Worthy to stand before the Son of Man. How will that happen? First John. First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the things that interest the minds of worldly people, and the people that do not know about heaven, that the regenerating work, the resurrection power has not taken effect in their lives, they love this, they love this, they love that. And they go about uh, carrying those things as if that's the thing that will take them to heaven and make them to spend eternity with God. All those things of the world that have already destroyed many lives and destroyed many churches and destroyed many families, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man, if any man, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And how do you know that somebody is not loving the world? He cannot preach the way he was preaching before. He cannot be very clear. He cannot be as firm as he was before. It starts in little ways. The daughter has gone out and has brought Babylonish garment. And the father said, what is this? And the daughter said, my father, that's the way I want to live. Babylonish garment fits me. It fits my complexion. It fits my life. It fits uh, my friends. And so the father keeps quiet. And lo and behold, uh, the father was looking for something in the wardrobe. And he saw the dress of the wife. What is this? This is another Egyptian garment. And when the wife came back, he said, My wife, I saw something. What did you see? Where did you see it? I saw it in your wardrobe. Let's go there. What is this one? When did you get this one? Whose money did you spend to buy this one? And then she says, Because now anybody going to do evil must defend evil. That's what I'm going to do. Whatever you want to do, you can do. That's where I stand. And I'll still be going to church. I want to wear it to church. But I wear it in other places. Because when I'm in Rome, I do as the Romans do. When I'm in deeper life, I dress as deeper life people dress. And when I'm outside there, my friends are still there. You know it now. And my colleagues are still there. My acquaintances are still there. I'm going to be like them. And the man is defeated in his family. He happens to be a preacher. He comes on the pulpit now. He reads many verses of scripture. He cannot pinpoint 
the word like he used to do because already he's a compromiser. Already the daughters have conquered him. Already the wife has conquered him. But we're coming back again to the word once delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. And if you're a sincere person, if you're in a place you cannot preach the word, if you're in a place you don't fit in, the honorable thing for you will be to check out and say, I used to believe that. I used to preach that. Now I see myself as a hypocrite because even if I preach it, my family cannot uphold it. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man, any man, whatever the title, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. And the lust thereof, but they that doeth the will, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Somebody there will abide forever. I said somebody there is abiding forever. Chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, now, at the present time, now are we the sons of God and the daughters of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. You will be like him. We will be worthy in Jesus' name. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. Whether he is uh, committing that sin openly or privately. I pity the people that will be in a church like this and they have decided they are not going to repent after they backslid and they are keeping a position but then they have to keep bold face and Everyone that knows them knows that they're living a conquered life, a defeated life, and a corrupt life. And then when they come in the open and they want to do their bit of, uh, you know, service, they use both face. And if you are coming and see if you knew something about them, they stand and they look at you and say, and so what? And then... You get out of their way. Those people that have become so hard in the sin that they say, and so what? And they use both face to drive everybody away. You will perish without remedy because there's nobody now. The messages will not touch you. Your friends cannot touch you. The pastor cannot touch you. Nobody can talk to you. That's how to perish. I pray you will not perish. Give me a good, deeper life. Amen. Look at verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sineth not. Whosoever sineth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, tell me, tell me, are you going to allow somebody of the devil to lay hands on you? He wants to pray for you. It will not happen to you. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Any amen over there? Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. 
for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That's how to be worthy, you'll be worthy in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now the circumcision that maintains our worthiness. It makes us worthy by saving us. It makes us worthy by reconciling us to the Father. It makes us worthy by canceling the punishment and the unwriting of ordinances against us. It makes us worthy by telling us our names are now written in the book of life. But then there's still something he wants to do. He wants to circumcise our heart. He wants to circumcise our lips. He wants to circumcise our inner man. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm reading here from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're reading from verse 6. It tells us here in verse 6. It says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. This is not the circumcision made by man. This is circumcision by God himself. And it is not circumcision on the body. It's circumcision on the heart. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the heart of thy seed. It wasn't to stop with the first generation. There are some people that are saying... We know what the pastor is thinking about. He wants deeper life to remain as in the first generation. And to them, they don't believe in miracles, the continuity and the constancy of miracles. They say it cannot happen. This is another generation of deeper life. The first generation, all we did, all we had, is so we can get to heaven. If the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation, if Jesus tarries, if they want to get to heaven, we must earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Whatever the generation, it says, I will circumcise your heart, I will circumcise the heart of your seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And in the New Testament, it tells us about that circumcision in Romans chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 2, we're reading from verse 29. It says in verse 29, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but is of God. They will do it for us. I said they will do it in us. Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 38. They shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, look at this, that they shall not depart from me. He will circumcise our heart and the remnants of the degradation that remains there, the remnants of the original sin, he will take away. He will purge us purify us. It will go deep into our inner man. It will go deep into our inner spirit. It will go deep into our heart. It will remove every stain of the Adamic nature in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Knowing this 
that her old man is crucified with him. This is another language for the circumcision of the heart. The old man crucified with him. And then he goes on that the body of sin might be destroyed. Circumcision. That the body of sin, the nucleus of sin, the origin of sin, the generator of sin, the one that is uh, making sin to germinate and then to spread that body of sin uh, that he might destroy it. He will destroy it. He will destroy it. In your life, he will destroy the body of sin. In your family, he will destroy the body of sin. And the fire of the Holy Ghost will come. It will burn every child out of your life in Jesus' name. Then it says that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth will not be slaves of sin. Henceforth will not be servants of sin. That henceforth you should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But that in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, in the same way, like Christ, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. To be dead indeed unto sin. You are dead to sin, not only that, indeed, in the very fact, in the depths of it, and everywhere you go, your life shows that you are dead to sin. When you are dead to sin, alcohol will not attract you anymore. Give me a good amen over there. Fornication will not attract you anymore. Adultery will not attract you anymore. The amen is dying down. Pornography on the net will not affect you anymore. And all those secret things you are looking for them, you will not look for them anymore. It's like somebody was familiar with you. That fellow is dead. He's been dead for a number of years now. And he or she had been buried. You don't go there looking for her again and looking for him again. The same thing was seen when it dies off in your life. And when you are circumcised in heart, that old man is dead and buried. It will not surface again to pull you down in Jesus' name. Verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It will not reign. It will not have dominion over you. You are going to have a brand new life and you are made worthy to walk in the streets of gold in heaven in Jesus' name. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the laws thereof. Neither yield your members, your hands, neither yield your members, your eyes, neither yield your members, your feet, neither yield your members, your mouth, neither yield your members, any part of your body as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It will happen. To you I said it will happen. Look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin, the cord that bound you to sin, that cord is caught. That chain is shattered. And that sin that connected you with your past life, that sin is washed away in the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. 
being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And your end everlasting life. In Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, looking at verse 11. It tells us in verse 11, in whom also he has circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. The circumcision that Paul was talking about in Galatians was the one made with hands. The Jewish people telling the Gentile believers, you must be circumcised with hands. And Paul, the apostle said, that's gone. That's not for us. But the circumcision without hands. Well, the circumcision without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, putting off, throwing away, making it die, mortifying it, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. A new life is beginning for you. A new heart is going to be given unto you. But you will have to do what this man, Isaiah, did. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 5. Then said I, Who is me? For I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean leaves, uncircumcised leaves. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, uncircumcised leaves, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and he said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged, and thy sin purged. There's going to be a cleansing right now. There's going to be a circumcising right now. And there's going to be a purging right now. The Lord will cleanse you through and through. Purge you through and through. And the Lord is going to purify you from the inner mind to every part of your life in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Psalm 52. Psalm 52. I read from verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garment, O Jerusalem. The holy city. The Lord is going to make every one of us holy. Holy in heart, holy in language, holy in thought, holy in imagination, holy in our plans, holy in our character, holy in church, holy outside the church. It says, we are the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. No more come unto thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the banks of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught, 
they that rule over them, make them to howl, make them to cry, make them to mourn, says the Lord. And my name continually, every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and that publisheth peace and that bringeth good tidings of good that publisheth salvation that says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. God will reign in your heart, he reign in your life, he reign in your family, he reign in your place of work. Everywhere you go, God will reign again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. For the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. No more disagreement, no more argument. No more disunity, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. For the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. When he has renewed us, when he has revived us, when he has circumcised us, when he has set us on fire, we'll go out of the gospel, the message of salvation. And everybody in our state, in our country, in our continent will hear that message of life in Jesus' name. Verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean sin. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you. The Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel will be your reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and very high. Is a servant of the Lord over there? I said, is a servant of the Lord over there? He'll promote you and lift you up in Jesus' name. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so much, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them, that shall they see. What you have not seen before tonight, you will see. The circumcision you have not heard of before, you'll hear of it in your life. And that which they had not heard, they shall consider. Are you part of this team? Are you part of that glorious church? Are you ready to pray now? Awake, awake, put on thy strength. No more they'll circumcise entering into your life anymore. Shake yourself from the doors and sit down and loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Let's rise up now. Let's make it a real time of prayer tonight. Don't allow tiredness. Don't allow weariness. The Lord has told us something. He wants us to be worthy. He wants us to be worthy of his presence and worthy of his power and worthy of his glory and worthy of all the promises he has laid down for us. He wants you to call upon him so that in every area of your life, he will take unworthiness away. He will make you worthy in every area. Open your mouth. And pray unto the Lord.